On today's program, we focus on industrial relations in the Caribbean. In particular, we look at the conflict between labor and government. Labor versus government. That's our program today. Don't go anywhere. Carb Nation is up next. Welcome to Carb Nation. I'm David Hines from Jamaica in the north to Guyana in the south. Public service workers have been clamoring for increased wages over the last two years. This, have, this has brought them into conflict with the governments who keep saying that they can't afford to pay the workers that amount of money that they're calling for. On Carib Nation today, we're going to try to tease out some of the issues raised by the workers and we'll also going to examine the position of the governments. In fact, we're going to have a kind of a round table discussion, we like to call it. And my panelists today are no stranger to Carib Nation. Dr. Claire Nelson, community activist, president of uh, the Institute, Institute of Caribbean Studies. Welcome again to Carib Nation. Thank you very much. John Sumner, Dr. John Sumner, noted economist here in the Washington, D.C. area. And Paul Tennessee, one of our correspondents and the man who wears many hats but today he will be wearing the hat of a trade union trade unionist not a trade union <laughs> <laughs> welcome welcome you all to carib nation good to see you guys again thank you very um much. listen i have a straight position workers have a right to a living wage and i don't care if the workers are calling for 500 dollars per month or 400 dollars per month the government must find it that's my position Clear you have a problem with that? If the government cannot afford to pay it, if there's no money in the banks, it cannot be paid. If they want that pay, it would mean, therefore, that we need to think seriously about cutting the number of workers in the public service. Everybody knows that in the Caribbean especially, everywhere in the world, but in the Caribbean especially, there is an inefficiency in the public service. So you are saying that the workers were clamoring for more wages in the Caribbean, they are out of order. I am saying that you cannot have more wages and expect to have the same number of workers. If they want more wages, then perhaps they need to look at cutting their ranks. John Sumner, what's your position on this issue? Well, it's not necessarily my position, but what is the correct position? Workers on the basis of fairness deserve to get a living wage or wage increases that are consistent with the level of inflation. But on the other hand, government's job is to manage the entire economy. And government has a responsibility not only internally within the country, but also to international institutions that are monitoring these economies in terms of their performance levels. But you see, that's my problem. I hear from you and you about these international organizations and cutting workers and all that. What I hear is this straight structural adjustment thing. It seems as though you guys have bought into this structural adjustment thing, lock, stock, and barrel. Paul, you stand with them? Well, the position is that all workers are entitled to a living wage. The question is, what is a living wage and how do you get it? In the private sector, if a company is making profits, workers have high levels of productivity, and they, they are arguing on the basis of rising cost of living. Yes, they have a case, and they have to press it forward. In the case of states, we have a more complex issue Definitely. where there is fiscal deficit. If there is a state with fiscal deficits, large debts, minus growth rate, if we have current account deficits, and if we have a state that is within a model of what we call crony capitalism, that is inefficient governance and corruption, then it's very difficult for such a state whether they to pay the workers. Anyway. Well, look, I am not an economist, but it seems to me that it is the workers who produce. Now, you may argue, you may tell me that public service workers don't produce anything. But without the public service, the country can't run. It seems to me that you have to, at some point, decide that you're going to invest in the workers. I agree. I agree. But the point is that the current level of public service workers in the region is much 
too high. Let's assume, for example, that the government has X amount and they have 10 times X workers. I'm saying that if the government is unable to increase the actual amount of dollar value in the budget allocated for wages, then in order to improve the quality of life and for those workers, they need to look seriously at cutting the level of workers. So and those send them where? Send them where? Cut when you take them off the provide, program? Where? Provide those kind of programs, those redundancy programs, those retraining programs that will allow them to go out and create but jobs a, for themselves. But there's another approach to it, and that, that approach is that governments earn uh, their income from taxation. And if you apply the rule that those who have more should pay more, those who have less should I pay agree. less, and for those who do not have a hand of solidarity should be handed out, then what we need is a proper taxation system. I will have an and argument in the with Caribbean, that. There in is Caribbean, not. many countries, because of crony uh, capitalism, I because all of countries. poor governance, uh, people are not collecting taxes as they should. But wait a minute, wait a minute here. Let me take Guyana as an example, where you had a big strike. 55 days, the public, servant, public servants went on strike. The, the average pay for a public servant in Guyana is 65 US dollars per month. How in heavens are you going to tell me that that's a living wage? And the government turned on top of that and said, it can only pay, what, 4 or 5% increase. John, isn't that unreasonable? Um, it is unreasonable. And as I said before in my earlier remarks, Workers deserve a living wage, and they deserve a wage that is consistent with the growth of inflation, increase in wage. However, you also have to look at what is very necessary for Caribbean countries to grow at this point in time is the ability to attract foreign investors. And if you increase the minimum wage and the general, the average wage level to the point that it's a disincentive for companies to come in, then you have a problem of lack of growth and deficit. No, I disagree with that. So I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, don't think I, I agree that there are, to some extent. But it's not so much that. It's also that the workers really don't have the skills to attract foreign investors. It's not just the money. How can you increase their wages? If we're talking about foreign investors, for example, in the private sector, how can you increase their wages when they don't have the skills to compete? They don't have it, right? I don't see it. So you're saying our workers in the Caribbean are not up to par when compared to All workers, workers are not up to par. But I, to come back to the public sector point of view, you have to recognize that the government, as um, Paul said, only way of earning income usually is through taxation. We have a problem there. That needs to be addressed. Unless you have state-owned industries, which, which, now, is our thing of the which past, is now something right? of the past. So therefore, we need to look at restructuring government, restructuring the private, public service to be more, quote unquote, corporatized, to run in an efficient manner you, so that those workers who are there are producing efficiently, including in, the tax collection. The, the, the tax thing collection is that board. it varies from country to country, context to context. If I'm living in a country like Barbados, I say the workers have a right to make high demands. If you're working in a country like Guyana, which, which has difficulties, you have to look at various factors. If you're in the case of Jamaica, where your growth rate is declining rather than, than it, increasing, exactly. there are problems. But it is also known that in times of prosperity in the Caribbean, the rich privatize the profits. And in times of crisis, they socialize the losses. If we look at the East, East Asian case, for example, they had growth rates over the last 30 years, 3 to 5%, 7, 8, and 9%, and never shared wages with the workers. They didn't even allow I don't want wages. you all to jump off and start giving me a whole lot of theory. I hear you about training and diversification. I hear you about attracting foreign investment. I hear you about the diversity and so on. What I know for a fact is that the working people in the Caribbean cannot live on the wages that they have at the moment. Oh, that's a fact. And that's I a fact. Saying, Nobody's arguing that. I, we have to, we have to reorganize that, the society to generate wealth. But while you're reorganizing the society, they got to eat. They got to live. And I you agree. can't re reorganize the society without them. Now, the government keeps saying they can't pay this money. Can't. Why the government can't pay the money? Why? And that's what I want you all to tell me. Why the government of Guyana cannot pay the workers, let's say, 125, 150 Well, in the case of the month? government of Guyana, they are so tied up with the IMF 
that the Minister of Finance had to come to Washington to ask how much he could give. Basically, that's the story. He has no control, and the government of Guyana, even though the ruling party is a communist party, a working class party, and had denounced the IMF, as soon as they came into power, they went into bed. So the, the problem IMF. is this structural adjustment, IMF World that's Bank. That's part of the problem. Yeah. But if you have a country where you have these de fiscal deficits, um, um, you, you, you have all kind of large debts and so forth, and you are not growing. Your economy is not growing. Yes. You will have to take a, carry through with structural clear, clear, with or without clear, the IMF. Clear. I I agree. The fact is that we live in a global economy. There is no way a government which owes more, so much money can afford to pay people more money unless they print money, and that is not an accepted acceptable thing to do. I am not an economist, so I can't speak from that perspective. But a little bit I know about economists mm. would lead me to believe that that is not acceptable. I think we need to expand the private sector. Ex exactly. Rather than concentrate more on the uh, government yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and the old not, politics. And that does not the have old, to be a long uh, run What happened is that the trade union movement had a model called political unionism, where we fought for political independence, where we brought political independence, where we followed Nick Rumors saying that let us first have the political kingdom and everything else will follow. And when we got independence, nothing followed. So what we need now is that we move away from that model and trade model. unions have to become more a civil society. A civil society model away from the political I'm parties and the government. I have a problem with this uh, socialization of the trade union movement. I think his, and you're the trade union expert, but historically the trade union has a role as champions of the workers. That is the workers' organized force in society. Coincidentally, the Caribbean is not an island unto itself. It's a group of countries which sometimes people who live in the islands call it a, a Caribbean islands, which we know that Guyana as a member is a mainland country. However, the Caribbean is a group, is among the group of nations. As a member of the group of civilized nations, the Caribbean has to operate within a certain international infrastructure. The international labor organization has certain standards, which goes towards the determination of wages and compensation for workers. And my point is that any evaluation of the need for workers to, to receive increased wages should be done within that structure. Oh, but the ILO supports proper living wage. The ILO they supports do. core labor standards. But the government, other governments sign these agreements, but they the do. government do not implement them. Well, you see, that's my point. I they don't I, implement I, them. I, you all have not answered my question yet. Can this Your government... question cannot be answered in the way it is asked. The point is, well, you, on, okay, you Paul and I seem to be on the same side, uh -huh. is, well, for now anyway, that unless there's a restructuring of the economy, a reorientation of the mentality of labor unions and workers to understand right. we're living in no, a brave new world. Like, like, and the private sector. The governments too, and it the has to be themselves. tripartite. No problem it has to that. be the governments, it has to be the unions, it has to be the private, private sector. sector and civil society. I agree. You cannot look, leave civil look, society look, 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 look. I know, I, I know that when I was growing up, my mother would send a small piece from the United States of America, and my auntie was taking care of us. I had to sit down and work out a budget. So much of this, so much of that, so much of that. What is priority? What is not priority? It seems to me that the problem with the government is that they are not prior prior prioritizing. That's, that's, that's Their the priorities are not. No, the problem with the government is that they, do not, they, they have been almost um, divested of power. They are virtually powerless. That's nonsense. The ministers that's, that's, of finance that's, that's are now working with no, no, the IMF, no, no, not wait, wait, with the wait, prime ministers. Wait, 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 they I, have no development I plan. They have that. no real strategy. But let they me turn the question. They are just working, deprivatizing, deregulating, liberalizing, and praying and hoping to God that somebody from abroad will come and invest. If you have $100 and yes. you have education, health, public service workers, roads, Police, security to pay for. What really is a priority? Is it health of people? Is it education of children? Is it there are priorities. I know exactly. what is not a priority, and a lot of things that the people in the government going on with, running up and down the world and spending money on all kinds of foolishness, take that money and pay the workers. But like John says, they're part of a world system. They cannot be a part of it. How, are you gonna, how can you be an island unto yourself? You have to play the game if you're living in this world. We are living in a different time, and we have to readjust. In the 60s, the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, the unions were very critical, as they were, 
to our political independence. Now they have to reorient their mentality to our economic what independence. Do, and not, they have not been doing that. What is that? What, is, what, what you think the unions, unions must the government do? Hold on, hold on, Paul. I want to focus on the unions. What is the role of the unions now in this new global dispensation that you are telling me about? The unions have to understand that the role of the worker in a nation is to participate, is to help to increase or maximize the economic earning power of the nation as a whole. So right? you're saying the union must now become part of management. That's what I hear you saying. The union must understand, people in the union, workers must understand their role in creating wealth creation. And the unions must also begin to request, demand a new structure of ownership of capital. All right, all right, so I, I hear you. Let me put this question to you all. Budget time, come around. Should the unions be at the table with the Minister of Finance in working out the budget? Not only the unions, but local governments, the private uh, no, sector. No, we can't have a union here now. You, but not the unions alone. But you, you see, you, I believe the unions, Paul, Paul, unlike, unlike, Paul. unlike Claire, huh? I believe that the union's role is that they have to be, separate themselves from political parties and become the leaders of civil society. So the unions, build a new power so the and unions develop still policies. have to the table and have to work out the budget? The union have to work on policies, that. yes. Claire, where you stand on that? Should the union sit at the table and help to work out yes, the budget? Yes, they have to. Not at their current level of understanding of global economy. But but now you Where are saying the that they must are come... very sophisticated. They think they are. Unions that are very sophisticated. Some are. Well, they, some can teach the others. Well, I would hope so. Unions need to have policy units. I agree with that. And they need that. to develop alternative policies because it's not coming from the government. That's true. I and would agree with that. And some of our private sectors are lazy. What That's true. They are not sufficiently competitive and aggressive. That's what, true. So what pressure are... should not only be put on the government but on the private Let, sector. What, what we are ignoring in this entire issue is this whole question of internal and external politics. Internal politics would suggests that unions and management can sit down around the table and come up with a living wage for workers. A performance contract so that workers can meet certain performance standards and criteria in return for the consideration on higher wages. We are ignoring the need for Caribbean and other developing countries to compete in an intensely competitive international market where wages is a driving, a major force, deciding factor in terms of the location of industries, private investment, yeah, but the attracting Caribbean, foreign okay, companies and may, all of that. Maybe so some my big point is that, have that, that we, need to look, we, need to have, we need to look at a competitive wages issue, an analysis of where our wages are in the Caribbean but, and where it needs to be for the whole well, Caribbean. I disagree with that. Because because that's, not sector, yeah, they, that's not public sector, sector. Yeah, they, that's not public sector. That's government sector, for yeah, example. The tourist right? sector is doing very well. The tourist sector is growing. I was just in Aruba, I go to Bahamas. They're doing very well, they have powerful unions, they're negotiating, they're getting a lot of good wages, they're getting a lot of good conditions. That, that's one of the leading sectors in the Caribbean is the tourist sector. But the point is that what we need is a tripartite approach. We have to have consensus building because if you're gonna be competitive in the world, you have to have your government, private sector, and the trade unions That is the ad together. John's argument is you the argument that they use together. in Jamaica, which I disagree with, that for example, there should be a devaluation to make our dollar more competitive. That means people no, 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 no. the poorer. That I do agree with that. Isolation. That cannot be done in isolation. It has to be done in relation to an overall policy if that devaluation will give you the competitive edge. But it would but not. It does not mean it will. Because it in would Asia, not. It in Jamaica, Former it would Prime not. Prime Minister of Dominica told me on this show, Carib Nation, about uh, two years or so ago, and this is a person who was known as a right-wing person, told me that you must not let the IMF and the World Bank come into your country and tell you what to do. And when they went into our country and tell you she must, tax, she must not tax base, she tell them go to hell. I am saying that the Caribbean governments must stand up to the IMF and the World Bank. I don't, I don't buy this thing that the IMF and the World Bank come to you and you aren't tied and you can't do anything. I think that is half it's of It's not problem. just a question of tying, is that there's intellectual poverty pervading the Caribbean. There is That's no true, new true. initiative on the part of governments or many of the private sector. The dynamic private sector in the Caribbean is in Trinidad. That's they're true. aggressive, they're expanding, they're doing things. They're investing in South Africa and all over the world. They're going into the Latin American market. But the other private sectors just want to buy and Should sell. Should the Caribbean government stand up to the IMF and the World Bank and tell them where to get off when they need to get off? 
That's well, you got to take that. You got to put that stand up context. to the IMF and the World Bank is to produce alternative policies. Should the Caribbean government stand up to the World the Bank and tell them we're going to go? That's what I want to know. Yes, they should. But can I stand for it? They should stand up, but they should be careful where they stand. They should be careful um, where they stand. But then I have to point, stand. We talked about Guyana <laughs> recently. Guyana recently qualified as one of the, the one of the heavily indebted poor countries. Under that arrangement, Guyana gained forgiveness of over 250 something million dollars in debt. Now, you, when you look at the balance sheet, you could either earn more money or spend less money and still be in an advantageous situation. Now, if Guyana was not a part of the, I, the IMF standby arrangement and the arrangement with the World Bank, Ghana would not have qualified for that 250 something million dollars in debt forgiveness. Mm. And this is money that the, the same workers we're talking about would have had to work and pay out of the taxes into the future. So the my point is, is it's a Ghana balancing act. In the first place, contracted $250 Kray million Nelson, in debt. Should the Caribbean stand up to the IMF and the World Bank? I think that there are some cases in which the governments need to be more, um, I was more steadfast in their approach to how they govern, how they make decisions regarding their development thrusts, right? And it may not necessarily mean paying workers more, but it may mean redistributing where they spend the money they have. So at least they don't have the same problem five years hence because they've not spent it on schools or spent it where they need to have spent it. Listen, the G7 nations recently um, forgave a lot of debt for third world country. And they say part of the reason that they do that or, or part of the incentive for them to do that was that these countries don't spend more money on health yeah. and, and, and education. Yeah. So it seems to me that um, these big countries, some of them are trying in some way to deal with the problem. But I keep saying over and over and over again that the governments in the third world, especially governments in the Caribbean, need to sit down and to decide what your priority is. But David, do you realize that to a large extent, governments themselves are becoming irrelevant? No, I don't buy that. Certainly not in the Caribbean. I don't, I don't buy that. that that's theoretically, that's theoret that may be theoretically true in terms of what people project for the world, but the governments are not very irrelevant. They're becoming, irrelevant. They're becoming the Caribbean. ineffective because All they right. are practicing that not a word. poor governance, they are corrupt, they are inefficient, and they are not producing alternative policies. And I don't that quite buy that. intellectually because... lazy. Corruption, corruption exists in every country in the world, and Paul, you're well Of course, but the poorer that. a country is, the more dangerous corruption is. You could be corrupt in America, perhaps, because they have a trillion dollar surplus. But when you're corrupt in Guyana, it may mean uh, thousands of people going under the poverty line. And therefore, you have to have higher standards with corruption. If you go into public service, you've got to make up your mind that you're going there to give service. You must get a decent wage, but you must give service. If you want to make money, go into private enterprise, the sky is the limit. You all raised the whole issue of uh, privatization yes. and, 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 and so on. Let's talk a little bit about privatization. Yeah, because you can't leave the equation. Let's, let's talk a little bit of, about privatization. As far as I'm concerned, privatization that, 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 that comes in and takes all the money out and leaves just a pittance and hoping that it will trickle down to the workers is not going to help the Caribbean. I don't have a problem with that argument. Nobody, if you're going to have a garage sale for priv in it, it's called <laughs> privatization, <laughs> then nobody should support that. But if privatization will bring increased production, productivity, more no wages think for the workers, what help the have, communities to develop, fine. What I really would have liked to see and in this service. rush of privatization across the world was an uh, indigenization of ownership, a broaden of the capital. The base. local private enterprise having, should have having share of that. employee it share ownership be program. It should not private making, enterprise. Making local people private in the country enterprise. understand what this new form of ownership means and having people in general be able to participate in this new form. What has happened, unfortunately, in most countries, the Caribbean and other third world countries, is that the very same companies or peoples that we nationalized from in the 60s, we are reselling to. So where have we come in 30 years? Full circle. Like the bauxite industry. Right. So they I have a problem with that. It when we want I to think there's it. a third way we need to look at. There are new models that we need to try. Where, for example, we talk about using or getting debt for workers, quote-unquote, debt in terms of future earnings of no, workers to, to give them shares but, in capital no, because be, wealth is created by ownership of capital. What we need is small 
and medium-sized businesses. John Trumpy and this small is and medium-sized businesses is more suitable to the Caribbean and is suitable to many, many countries, even very large countries. And sufficient emphasis is not... You are big on this story. I, 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 I am it. very high on, on studies and analysis. I don't believe in just saying privatization because private industry is supposed to be theoretically better than government. If your workers are not well trained, if your wage levels are too high, you're not going to get privatization. If your technology is inefficient and can't compare or internationally, low, low, you're not going to get successful privatization. So I believe in privatization that is relevant and opportune at the right time, in the right industries where we stand a chance to be competitive. But there's a role for government. And government are sometimes as well as the trade union is, and they must recognize the keepers of the food. In the keepers Jamaica of the food. The respected. government will put a tax on gasoline, the people mash up the country. Um, With good reason. I feel they are, they are the right, they are the right to do it because um, the government was wrong to, 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 to increase that tax. But then the government say, if we don't tax gasoline, we got to find the money somewhere else. It seems to me that all I hear the government saying is that we can't do it. We can't, we can't do anything for the poor man in the region. What is going to happen to the region if our people, our working people, cannot have a living wage? 30 seconds. What is going to happen is collapse, but I don't think it needs to be that way. I think with vision, with strategic leadership, the governments can lead the way with the tripartite um, approach. approach, building social capital. Barbados is the only country in the region that has very high social capital, where people work together to make the country grow. Well, the workers deserve a living wage. You said that about four times already. <laughs> the countries can afford it. It's not a question of having to take it out of tax revenue. You're claiming two point, in the case of Guyana, 2.5% growth, mm -hmm. right? We're right. back on the growth path. Funds can come from a number of places. The question sometimes is not if you can afford to pay, but if you can afford not to pay. If you don't have those workers behind ah. you, then all is lost. Part Tennessee. We need strong trade unions, strong private sector, small and efficient governments, non-corruption. They have to fight corruption. They have to be very encryption. We need good governance. And we need new policies in the Caribbean. And on that note, I want to thank you guys for coming on here. I know it's been quite fast and heated. You all move like a, like, like, like a race car. But that is how we want to do it on this type of program. Clay Nelson, thank you for coming on to Carib Nation. Thank again. you. John thank you Sumner, for um, Paul Tennessee, our correspondent here. Look, I stand on one side of the fence. The working people of the Caribbean have made tremendous sacrifices for that region. And I think the demand for a living wage is nothing too hard. The governments, with some creativity, with some kind of bold initiative, can find the money to at least keep the workers above the poverty line. On that note, I want to thank you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carib Nation. And remember, as always, our motto on this program is one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation. And as my man David Rudder would say, what? Rally round the West Indies. <laughs>